Hey, thanks for stopping by. If this is your first time here, Atelunacy is a pop culture podcast where we evaluate what African movies and TV shows show and tell us about society. The themes we commonly touch on are race, class, gender, and sexuality, all through a social justice lens. We pick out a movie or TV show that I enjoyed watching, and each week we cover a different theme before moving on to the next show. Currently, we're looking at drum rolls. Namaste Wahala. Namaste Wahala is a Nigerian romantic comedy that was released in 2021. It's the story of Chidima, aka Didi, and Raj. Didi is a Nigerian lawyer, and Raj is an Indian investment banker or some money type thing like that. They meet in the cheesiest way you ever saw, fall in love, their parents crump their server saying, hell no, they fight, break up, cue a heartbreak montage to have all the best of them, then sufficient time passes, things happen and they make up, hello, happily ever after, yay. Namaste Wahala will be a six part review. The six key themes we'll look at are one, fat girls and sex, two, capitalism and relationships, black tax in particular, three, capitalism and relationships, on succession in particular, four, gender and housework, five, violence against women, and six, relationships, love and romance. Hope you enjoyed as much as I enjoyed making it. Let's talk about violence against women. One of the biggest storylines in Namaste Wahala is about violence against women. This is the one thing that ties the entire film together, and I don't think that it could have been done worse. A good faith argument would be it was just poor execution on the part of the filmmakers, while a really critical one would be that the entire storyline was inserted purely for the purposes of virtue signaling. I'm inclined to cut my weight with those on the virtue signaling side of things. I'll show you how, but first, let's talk about Roxanne Gay. In her essay, The Careless Language of Sexual Violence, Roxanne Gay points out all the ways in which movies and TV shows use rape and other violence against women's storylines as mere plot points that re-energize shows and drive up ratings. The essay is mostly about rape, and everyone should read it. In it, Roxanne Gay says we talk about rape, but we don't really talk about it. And that is the best way to describe how Namaste Wahala handles violence against women. They use it, they talk about it, but they don't really talk about it. Namaste Wahala opens with Raj and Didi literally bumping into each other during their respective morning runs at the beach. They don't exchange contact information or nothing. They just stare at each other for an uncomfortable, interminable length of time, then run off and Raj decides he's going to marry that girl. Enter violence against women to the rescue of writers who don't know what else to do and how else to signal their virtue. Raj and Didi meet again at a fundraising event organized by an NGO that helps abused women and that is run by Raj's cousin, Leila. That's the first purpose of the abuse storyline, to bring our two lovers back together. They had met at the beach, but hadn't exchanged any contact information, so there was that small conundrum, however, shall we bring them back together? Anyway, they meet at this Violence Against Women NGO fundraiser, exchange remarkably dumb lines, and then move on to a singing and dancing montage that frankly goes on way too long. That's the purpose of the Violence Against Women storyline for them. It brings them back together and officially launches their romance and the movie. Raj came to this fundraiser for abused women with his black male friend, Ima, who refers to it casually as an event. An event, like a concert or some other trite thing, then proceeds to talk about how the only reason he's here is to look for investors and get someone to listen to his demo. This is Ima's sole purpose for attending a fundraiser for victims of violence against women, violence meted on women largely by men. Both Ima and Raj feel zero discomfort from the fact that it is men, men like them, who are terrorizing the NGO women. Didi also brought her friend to this event. Why is her friend Angie here? To take her mind off her fresh breakup and score her an eligible bachelor. Just to be clear, Angie's sole purpose at an event to raise funds for battered women is to take her mind off her breakup and score her an eligible bachelor. Does Didi have an issue with this? No, it was in fact her idea. This event is being held at the Radisson Blue, which hello money. It's also full of rich people, rich men for sure. Domestic violence here is used to sanitize wealthy people in our eyes so that we see them as people who willingly heed the call to come and give money to help the poor battered women. And here poor is about class, not poison, you poor thing. 
The rich people are coming in to literally save the day, save those women. It's another in a long line of lies about how philanthropy will save us. It's capitalist PR for the rich make them look like the good guys who rush in to support good causes with their money. It's a blatant attempt to obscure how the rich are the primary beneficiaries of an unjust system and the ones actively upholding the system that's killing the rest of us. It's like the cowboys and the Indians. James Baldwin talks about how as a child when watching the westerns, he would root for the cowboys against the Indians. Then as an adult, he realized that he was the Indians. That he is the Indians. The film does the same thing as those westerns. It tries to make us see ourselves as the good wealthy people and root for them. When we are in fact their victims, we are the poor people living in conditions of squalor that increase our risk of suffering violence because of their decisions and the system they profit from. The film, in presenting rich people as good, generous philanthropists, tries to make us ally ourselves with the rich, see ourselves as them, not as the poor battered women who are dependent on their charity in order to survive. So at this fundraiser, for the NGO that deals with women who have been assaulted or abused, Emma's there to score a record deal or get someone to fund his business. Angie's there to take her mind off her breakup and score her a rich man. The purpose of that fundraiser that is allegedly for victims of violence is to bring our two lovers together and sanitize wealthy people in our eyes. There's also something very not all men in the presence of all those rich men. Anyway, the next thing that happens is one of the women who was at the NGO event is beaten up by the son of a wealthy Nigerian chief. Do the filmmakers use this to emphasize the plight of women in a patriarchal society that has normalized male aggression? Nah, no, bruh. The purpose of the violence against women this time is to introduce drama and conflict between Didi and her dad. Her dad is representing the man who beat up the girl and Didi is well representing the girl who was beaten so easy conflict. Also, everything about the way they film the battered woman is just wrong. Didi gets a call that the woman has been attacked. She rushes to what is supposed to be the hospital, whereupon the battered woman turns like she's being unveiled or whatever. The makeup guys on their part do their best to make sure we gasp, we're shocked, jarred in some way. Except we're used to this. We are inundated with stories, pictures, videos of violence against women. Every TV show has an episode. Many Episodes of battered women, sexually assaulted women, harassed women, murdered women. We've seen it all in varying degrees of brutality and gruesomeness. This idea that they need to shock us in some way is, I think, just really misguided. Yes, it matters how badly he beat her up. But even if it was <clears throat> just a slap that left Nari a mark, I would be pissed as fuck that a man thinks he has the right to lay his hands on you at all. It's like the filmmakers imagine we need to be shown ever more gruesome after pictures in order to come to the conclusion that what happened was despicable and indefensible. There's something about the way the battered woman turns to Didi that just screams gratuitous violence. In that moment, it felt to me like that entire scene was done purely for entertainment purposes, and I know films stories are for entertainment but there's something repulsive about showing us the battered face of a woman purely for entertainment purposes it's like we've seen battered women please that's not entertaining and shouldn't be framed as such ever anyway Didi sees that battered woman, decides to take the case which pits her against her dad and now the violence against women storyline is now about a father and a daughter at odds so far, we haven't said anything about violence against women, not the causes, not the myriad of effects, not the ways to address it, nothing about patriarchy and all the ways society justifies and props up ideas that perpetuate violence against women. Nope. Just this lower class woman was assaulted by this son of a rich man, and now our hero Didi will represent her, even if it means going against her father, with the help of the Indian woman who owns the NGO. <sighs> One day, we'll talk about how NGOs are a scum. One day. Back to the violence against women storyline. That really isn't. So they set up an arbitration of sorts with Didi, Indian woman from the NGO, and the battered woman. The other side has the rich man who assaulted our girl, Didi's father, and two other lawyers from his law firm. At the meeting, the other team shares footage that makes it look like our girl, who was assaulted, was the aggressor because she stabbed the guy's hand with a pocket knife. As it turns out, pocket knives in Nigeria are illegal, so the other team says that let things go if our assaulted girl drops the lawsuit. Meeting adjourned. Next thing you know, Didi's yelling at 
the victim, talking about, why didn't you tell us? Then the wildest thing happens. Bibi literally asked the victim how a man could have beaten her up if he was stabbed. And I was like, first of all, does she even know men? This man's hand barely looks affected. It's such a small wound. Makes you wonder how she thought that would incapacitate a grown-ass man. And second, hello victim blaming our old friend. It was going to be quite a surprise if we'd gone all this way without victim blaming entering the chat. It's writing like this that makes me disinclined to believe that this storyline was added in good faith and not just for the purposes of virtue signaling. The argument can be made that Didi was angry when she suggested that our victim was lying, that she didn't really mean it. Okay, say that's the case. Why didn't she apologize later when she was calmer? Why didn't she walk such a dangerous statement back? Towards the end of the film, even Roger's mother, Roger's mother gives some half ass apology for her behavior. Why wasn't this done? Why wasn't it considered important to clarify to the victim herself and perhaps to the people watching the story that what was said to that girl in the heat of anger wasn't okay? Our victim withheld that information because she was scared that she would not be believed. And Didi proved her 100% right. Didi should have apologized to her. It was wrong as a person and it was wrong in her professional capacity as a lawyer working with victims of violence. What the hell happened to believe victims? That man's body language says it all. He knows he's untouchable. Our girl was right to be scared. Anyway, good sense partially returns to Didi. Partially. And she chooses to believe our girl. She goes out seeking evidence at the hotel where it happened. She speaks to the receptionist who says that the CCTV footage she's looking for is unavailable multiple times. What does our girl Didi do when it looks like she won't be getting that footage? She brandishes the picture of the girl who was assaulted and then proceeds to ask questions like, what if it was your sister? Would the footage still be unavailable? <sighs> something about that scene is so difficult to watch and so infuriating. There's something so invasive about showing that gruesome picture to strangers without the consent of the victim. Beyond that, I'm just wondering why she's frustrating and guilt-tripping Mia workers in that hotel. What are front desk workers going to do, huh? Go against management and risk their jobs? Bitch, please. This is class warfare. Leave the workers alone. If you so desperately want to get your hands on that footage, subpoena the hotel or send them a demand letter or whatever the legal thing that says a crime was committed in your hotel and unless you want to be considered culpable or otherwise implicated, you need to share the footage of what happened that night. Now we're made to somehow feel like these front desk workers, these women are being difficult. Come on! Go flex your muscle and management and the owner of the hotel, not mere workers who only follow instructions handed to them from the top. Anyway, the worker tells her an imposing woman came and took it. Didi, in a fit of righteous indignation that is, I suppose, supposed to show us how committed she is to the pursuit of justice, busts into her father's boardroom and accuses him of having the footage from the hotel destroyed. Once again, this violence against women storyline exists to build up the conflict and drama between father and daughter. Didi and her father exchange harsh words, and in her righteous indignation, she moves out of home. This moving out of home because of a fight with her father over the assault case is what pushes the story forward. She goes to Raja's place. Raja's mom is away, so they do the nasty things his mother's been keeping them from doing. And then his mother comes home unexpectedly. Big fight. Raj calms everyone down. Didi and Raj's mother engage in some extreme nonsense involving competing for his attention and affection by cooking for him. I cover this absurdity extensively in um, the segment on women and housework. Remember, Didi's at Raj's place because of a fight with her dad. Her mother's like, ah uh ah, -uh, where my kid at? Her mom goes to her best friend Angie's place, finds Didi's nowhere to be found, so she settles for fat shaming and slut shaming Angie. I cover the film's treatment of fat girls and sex in that segment. Later, she goes to Raj's place to pick Didi up. Another big fight ensues, and this time, Didi lives with her. Sad, heartbroken Didi continues to work on the assault case. Just as a brief recap, the violence against women storyline was most recently used to cause a fight between Didi and her father, which leads to her leaving home and moving in with her boyfriend. Moving in with her boyfriend leads to eventual beef with him, courtesy of his mother, which leads to a breakup and sad Didi working on the assault case again. Cool. 
Didi, who up to this point has not utilized any of the legal methods available to her to compel the hotel to release the CCTV footage, tries another way to get it. This time, she tries to speak to the CEO himself, and I suppose this is to show us how determined she is that she even went straight to the Indian CEO. How brave. The CEO dismisses her, saying something about how his security team handles such issues, then walks away. Next up on the things we're asking of the violence against women storyline, reuniting our lovers again. Raj appears and they haven't seen each other since that second breakup involving Didi being whisked away by her mother. While they're saying hey to each other, the CEO appears and it turns out that he and Raj are friendly. So CEO says he'll help however way he can as a favor to Raj because Raj saved him from losing a lot of money a while back. And if you thought we're done using the assault case for every other reason but shedding light on violence against women, you're wrong. Our lovers are now back together. And when Raj suggests they go see Leila, the Indian woman, Indian CEO man packs up, all excited. And would you believe it? The Violence Against Women storyline is used to bring together Leila and the CEO as well, which is a storyline that should have been left out of the show entirely. Jesus Christ, what adult still thinks secret admirer stories are romantic? Lord. My thoughts on that are covered extensively in the love and romance section. In closing, the hotel sends the CCTV footage, which Didi plays at their next arbitration meeting, and it's decided that Didi won, and her father congratulates her along with everyone else. Then her dad fires his female employee who'd taken the CCTV footage in the first place. What does Didi demand having won? Brace yourself. She demands that the abuser attend anger management because personal anger is obviously the problem and not patriarchy, always society has normalized the treatment of women as second-class citizens. We'll talk about this anger management thing and close with it. This scene confirmed to me that the assault storyline was never about covering the plight of women in a society in which violence against women is normalized. It was never about that. It was always about Didi and her dad. Leila, the NGO woman, says to Didi after the win, I think your dad just paid you a compliment. Then everyone celebrates without anyone saying anything to our girl, the victim. They're celebrating the win. They're celebrating Didi's win. Our victim's win is celebrated incidentally. It's not the main thing. And that tells you everything about the purpose of the violence against women storyline. The fact that the film suggests that the issue is an anger management problem also confirmed that the storyline was never about the plight of women. If it was, the conclusion would have been far more complex than that man had anger management issues. The barest research reveals that this is a victim-blaming conclusion and one that reduces systemic issues to the moral failures of a single man. Anyway, I could not put it better than this statement by NOMAS, which is the National Organization for Men Against Sexism. I'll read um, really most of the statement um, by NOMAS, with the exception of the last paragraph, which you know, doesn't really apply in this situation. Um, but, you know, you can see if you want. I'll also link to it down below if you want to read all of it. Position statement against anger management as a response to men's violence against women. NOMAS, the National Organization for Men Against Sexism, strongly opposes the use of anger management or anger management programs as a criminal or civil disposition or means in which to deal with violence against an intimate partner. Over the last 30 plus years of experience working with men in battery programs, including the experience of domestic violence advocates, it is clear that men are not out of control, but in fact use their ostensibly out of control anger as a tactic to control, dominate, instill fear, and gain and maintain power over their partner. He is out of control of her. Men who attend battery programs appear at domestic violence court hearings or when asked by police who arrive at domestic violence calls can and do decide to manage their anger in ways that will not cause them to incur additional consequences. Since the majority of domestic violence perpetration is committed by men against their intimate female partners, issues for the LGBTQ community will require separate consideration not included in the statement. Whenever men are ordered to complete an anger management program, it is typically shorter in duration, 13 sessions, than most battery programs, 26 or 52 sessions for lower criminal charges on an isolated incident. Those same men frequently are referenced as first-time offenders. This practice 
excuses any and all previous incidents. His behavior looks as if it was less serious when in fact the seriousness of his abusive behavior remains unknown with the exception of the woman he has and may continue to abuse. Anger management programs and practices place blame on the victim. Its practices require her to participate and take responsibility for managing his anger and behavior, simultaneously diminishing his full accountability and responsibility for his behavior. Anger management programs and practices implies his inability to control his anger whenever anger management practices are offered as a solution to his behavior. This affords him an additional opportunity to not take full responsibility for his behavior. Anger management practices collude with the batterer by disregarding and or rejecting sexist, misogynist, entitlement, privileged attitudes and beliefs which perpetuates men's abuse of the woman in which they are partnered. Anger management does not take into account a man's premeditated controlling behaviors which inflict increasing fear and terror in his partner over time. It is clear that intimate partner violence is not driven by a man's anger and lack of self-control. It is clearly driven by his imposing need to have power over in order to maintain domination over his partner. Anger management practices psychologize a batterer's abusive and controlling behaviors as an individual problem. Its practices and strategies ignore the social and political contexts that have historically condoned and perpetuated men's violence against women. In the end, society is not required to assume responsibility for addressing the cultural, social and political challenges when holding men accountable. Society will not be required to achieve the endemic, social, political and institutional changes essential to ending violence against women. Better accountability programs that embrace a socio-political anti-oppression analysis can be an option as a viable mechanism for holding offenders accountable in conjunction with the criminal and civil justice systems for acts of domestic violence against an intimate female partner. That's the end of the, um, the excerpt of the NOMA statement written by Gregory White for NOMAS. Ending men's violence task group. This. This is why no good faith argument in defense of the Namaste Wahala filmmakers can withstand even the barest scrutiny. They did a terrible job in this one. They had no business using violence against women for all these other extraneous reasons. There's just no way to justify what they did. None. Zero. That does it for today. Go read Ruxan Gay's The Careless Language of Sexual Violence. It's more than worth it. Until next time, guys. Remember who you are. Love life. Love people. Stay alive.